I'd like to welcome you all to the Caritas Consciousness Project. I'm Gloria Quilliu, and Caritas is all about promoting the evolution of consciousness as the key to individual growth and global healing. We do this through online presentations and interviews with guest speakers such as this, and we also have classes and study groups. We draw from a wide assortment of both ancient wisdom and leading edge studies in science, consciousness, spirituality, and philosophy. And we've been doing this since 2003, but unfortunately we didn't start recording these uh, events until beginning of 2020. Um, however, uh, our video recordings, the ones that we have recorded since then, are viewable through our website, which is caritascenter.org, and also on our YouTube channel, which is Caritas Consciousness Project. Uh, as a nonprofit organization, we rely on the support of our members and donors to keep our program going. And if you enjoy our presentations and would like to support this program, you can make a donation or become a member by going to our website and uh, and just going to the membership page or just clicking a donation button on any page. And now let me introduce today's speaker. Uh, Veronica Goodchild is Professor Emerita at Pacifica Graduate Institute and an affiliate member of the Interregional Society of Union Analysts. Educated in London and the USA, She's a teacher, a Jungian psychotherapist, and author. Led by dreams and pursuing her long interest in spirit matter connection and the subtle realm, she's explored sacred sites in England, France, Greece, Peru, and Egypt. Walking solo on one of the Camino paths in France, initiated by a dream and her concerns about our environmental crisis, crises, um, inspired her to create her own pilgrimage journeys, combining visits to sacred sites with the mythic and ancient stories that underlie many temples, shrines, and oracular portals. A recent trip to Egypt has rekindled an abiding interest in our relationship to the stars and our cosmic origins. Veronica lives in southwest France. And Veronica, welcome and thank you so much for making the time to be with us today. You're so welcome, Gloria. Thank you so much for um, inviting me. <laughs> so, and welcome to all the participants. Thank you for coming. Okay, so would you like to share your screen now and I will start share your my screen. Okay. Okay, is that working? Yeah. Okay, great. Image. Who Actually, is that? Is that St. Teresa? Is that? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's actually Mary Magdalene. Ah, Mary Magdalene. So, um, but this, um, I'll, I'll start with this, with this one. I'm just going to introduce with a, with a couple of quotes. Um, Jung observes about the transition that we're in the following. A mood of universal destruction and renewal has set its mark on our age. This mood makes itself felt everywhere, politically, socially, and philosophically. We are living in what the Greeks call the kairos, the right moment for a metamorphosis of the gods of the fundamental principles and symbols. So we're living in this extraordinary moment of, everyone can see it across the planet, um, huge uh, transition at the ending of one age and the approaching of the other, but this in-between stage is clearly very difficult to navigate both collectively and individually very often. And here's what Einstein said, Einstein writes, imagination is more important than knowledge. 
for knowledge is limited, where imagination embraces the entire world, stimulating progress, giving birth to evolution. It is the language of the soul. Pay attention to your imagination and you will discover all you need to be fulfilled. And again, wrote, Jung wrote, the soul comes from the stars and returns to the stellar regions. Well, I'd like to begin with a dream I had of Jung, showing me a newly discovered star that he links with Earth's energy lines. And I'm sharing this dream as I feel it is not only personal, but like some dreams could be relevant for others too. So as you hear it, listen as if it's yours and see if anything gets activated in you. In addition, it effectively symbolizes the essence of my talk. I could basically tell you this dream and that would be enough. <laughs> so the dream takes place in Provence, France, a landscape associated for me with both the Grail and Mary Magdalene, a place where I feel at home. And in fact, my home is here. I'm with my daughter, and we go inside an old church, which turns out to be a shrine to Mary Magdalene. Then Carl Jung comes up to me and indicates that there is something he wishes to show me and takes me outside the church. It turns out that the shrine has to do with a previously undiscovered star. And he points up to the sky, which though covered with clouds, clears as he points upward and we see the brightly shining star together. It feels like a big secret between us. I am overwhelmed by what he is telling us. I'll just click the, that admit button. I'm overwhelmed by what he is showing me. It feels very significant. Then he points to the path that leads from the church straight out into the distance. Jung says, this is the dragon path, and it links with the other sacred shrines, implying shrines to Mary Magdalene. In the dream, I know that the dragon paths are the Chinese description for the invisible energy lines that link holy places together on the planet. By pointing to both the star and the dragon path, Jung is showing me something even more important than the church. That is the idea conveyed in the, in the dream. So the dragon paths are these subtle energy lines, um, electromagnetic currents often called ley lines or serpent paths. Sometimes they're called fairy paths. And they're the kinds of places that when they cross over, um, they are considered thin places or power places and many cathedrals, temples, and stone circles are often built on them because this is where spiritual activity and visions can take place. And they're often aligned to star constellations. They're where the stars are grounded, as it were, to create holy shrines on earth. And um, when we come to crop circles, um, those too are built on those kinds of lines. Now, this is a picture of a church that is dedicated to Mary Magdalene. It's in a village called Saint Maximin La Sainte Baume in Provence. Um, and it's actually the place where her, where her relics are kept. So this is another picture of Mary Magdalene. I mean, a statue and she's holding her sacred oil jar or a grail cup. That's at Vesele, another very famous basilica to um, Mary Magdalene. And here she is again holding her jar. Now this is a painting um, in a village called Saint-Marie de la Mer in the south of France, in Provence. And it's uh, now it's a sort of coastal resort, but it has an 11th century chapel right in the middle of it, which is funny with all the modern buildings all the way around but it's a very, very famous shrine to Mary Magdalene and her daughter, Sarah. Um, so those are just some pictures to, to move us along. 
I was deeply moved by this dream and by the presence of Jung and what he was showing me. Symbolically speaking, we could say that the star could be considered a new understanding or revelation, indicating perhaps a new worldview or a new hope for the awakening of humanity at this critical time, beyond orthodox religion, which is symbolized by the church. So we're out in life. That seems a very significant detail to me. It takes me out, outside. The dragon is the creative energy of life, which in alchemy guards the, tr the treasure. The star as a new constellation or as a messenger is linked to the dragon paths, which also points to the alchemical dictum as above, so below. The relation of spirit and matter, and for me, its new conjunction in a subtle imaginal world that is breaking through in our time in among other things, synchronicities, crop circles, UFOs, near death experiences, Kundalini and other mystical experiences, experiences which involve visionary states of a psychophysical nature. It seemed as if the attempt to advance our understanding, for me beyond what Jung made explicit in his lifetime, is for the sake of my daughter, that is for the next generation or for the future. And the linking of the sacred sites are the places where the stars are grounded as it were, holy ground, celestial earth, as philosopher and theologian Henri Corbin calls it, the spiritualization of matter or earth's imagination and the redemption of the feminine, of anima mundi, the soul of the world, of eros and love, a key theme of the 12th century grail legends. So it seems to me that the dragon paths link shrines to Mary Magdalene as she is an archetypal presence touching the imagination of many people at this time. Primarily, I feel, because she's not an overly spiritualized version of the feminine, like Mary the mother can be. The Magdalene has a strong presence in France, supported by historical and legendary facts that she lived and taught here, traveling to Provence from Palestine and then Egypt after the resurrection of Jesus. She's honored in many churches and shrines in France, and even ones now dedicated to Mary the Mother are thought to be originally sacred to Mary Magdalene. And she's human. I think that's her appeal too. She loved and she lost her beloved and suffered a great deal. And according to the Gnostic New Testament texts, she was considered the main disciple of Jesus and most likely his consort or his bride. She was a visionary and she was called the woman who knew the all. She was also called a mirafore, which is a woman who heals with myrrh and other sacred oils like spikenard. And this is a tradition of sacred oils rooted in Egypt that carried on celestial medicine, basically. The oils link to other star systems, they have many qualities. Um, it's extraordinary. When I was in Egypt um, for a long uh, two month um, process, um, working with the oils was, was a big part of it. And also she links instinct and spirit, soul and body, and she's not a heavenly queen. And in this regard, she's very similar to the black Madonnas and is often aligned with them. And this is a picture of um, a black Madonna uh, in a church um, in a place called Le Puy en Valais, which is the town where you can start one of the pilgrimage paths through France. And that's actually the one I did. Uh, it runs all the way to the southwest of France um, at a place called Saint Jean Pied de Port before you walk up over the Pyrenees and continue on in Spain. But what is curious and interesting to me about this particular statue is that she's named Mary Isis. Um, and Mary was uh, an initiate of the mysteries um, uh, and the visionary imagination, 
And in this regard, uh, let's see, sorry, I've lost my place here. Uh, and there's a great example of this uh, in the book that was published in 2010, uh, which was the complete gospel of Mary Magdalene called uh, the gospel of the beloved companion. It's a beautiful, it's, it's not in any other uh, uh, text, Gnostic text or anything. It's a, a vision of her climbing the tree of life and meeting at every branch, a guardian and a challenge. So it's a, it's a wonderful, it's almost like a picture of Jung's individuation process or self-realization really. It's quite beautiful. Um, and so you're invited by this um, account of this extraordinary vision to face the challenges along the path of an illumination and to become a cre creative co-participant in service to the new unfolding story for our world. And um, as I mentioned, here she's connected to Isis and Isis is the Egyptian queen um, of heaven, earth and underworld. She's the major, uh, the, the Isis Osiris myth is essentially a death and rebirth myth, exactly like Christianity. And um, Isis uh, is related to Sirius, the star Sirius, uh, which is the brightest star in our sky and considered the sun behind our sun, our spiritual sun. And according to the indigenous wisdom keeper that I worked with when I was in Egypt at Abydos, at the temple of Abydos, um, Mary Magdalene shares the same soul essence, he said, um, as Isis. Okay. Who also, you know, deeply loved, lost her husband and um, reassembled him. But in Egypt, she is very connected to the star Sirius. So here is Mary Isis. Um, so we might consider the linking of the star to the dragon paths to the subtle energy as a combination of, de of the descent of spirit into matter and the rise of matter, earth, to a more spiritual or subtle level. So it's this imaginal world between the world of the subtle body that I feel through the various what I call signatures beginning with synchronicity, which I'll go into in a minute, um, are like a global dream, if you like. They give us hints of the kind of consciousness that is unfolding on our planet and becoming more important on our planet at this time. So, um, it could be too that the the um, Grail Cup is also the chalice, if that's also what in the other pictures Mary might have been holding, um, is also a very good symbol um, for this same idea of, because the cup receives spirit from above, but draws up energy from below. And the so-called ascension process that many people talk about for me is not really ascension as in going up that's more like the old thing of you know disappearing into a spiritual bliss or something but today the higher conscious one is a lesser one if I can say that because spirit is descending that's the thing we are meant to be inhabiting both spirit and earth energies that's that's to me um one of the most important things that's happening at the moment. And I'll go into that in, in some more detail. So, um, and here's a, a, another picture of Mary Magdalene. Um, this is from a chapel outside of, or on the edge of Paris at Neuilly. And I love this one because here she actually is a black Madonna. So, I hope you can see how the dream in a way condenses the four main points, points of my talk that I hope, hope to illustrate in various ways. 
the union of spirit and matter, the subtle body, the creative imagination, and an emerging worldview. And here is the Grail Cup. You have the various Lancelot and Percival. You, you can see the various quote unquote knights around the round table. And here they're almost worshiping it. It's, it's an image of the mystery of the Grail too. So um, my dream, I'm going to move a bit into synchronicity here. Um, I, as I said, I mentioned the word signature. So I have these, I call them signatures. They begin for me with synchronicity, but synchronicity broadens into other things, which we'll get into. And I actually looked up the root of the word because it's quite interesting what signature actually means. And it means in its root, the mark or sign of a companion that one is to follow. I thought that was really beautiful. So there, as you'll see, I, I strongly believe that such things should be followed. Um, and I'll get into that. So my dream actually constitutes a synchronicity because synchronicity at its heart, as you know, um, is a clue to the mystery of how psyche or spirit joins with matter or some event in the world. And my dream came just as I was about to send out my songlines manuscript out into the world, a book in which I explore synchronicity and how it leads to this subtle imaginal world through these different examples. Um, and also it was a synchronicity that first made me realize when I really looked into the depths of what synchronicity actually is, is that this is the phenomenon that requires a new worldview. So I'll elaborate that a little bit as we go along. It has to do with this connection with spirit and nature. Now, speaking of which, this is probably uh, a slide that many of you are familiar with. It's described in different ways. Um, Jung shows this in his paper on flying saucers. It's, it's called there, the pilgrim, the spiritual pilgrim discovering another world. Um, and so you see that she's on, on the ground more or less in this world, but she's peeking her head through what's called the window onto eternity. But here she's a great example of what's happening at the moment because she's rooted here, but she's also accessing a world that is very strange beyond it. Now, on the top left corner, you'll see two wheels connected. And those are the wheels of time and eternity. And a synchronicity is in fact that moment where time and eternity erupts into this world. But you can see there are lots of strange things going on. And then actually, when I was looking at this, when I was assembling my slides, I suddenly realized that if you look at the top middle, it looks like a moon, but then I thought, I wonder if things from the other side are coming into this side as much as we're coming from here to there. And I'd never actually seen that before. And I suddenly thought, no, it is the two-way thing. That's exactly right, if that makes sense. I hope it makes sense. So we're going through a certain window, if you like, to anomalous or more extraordinary experiences, but that world is also wanting to reach us. I think that's the important point there. Um, so that's that one. And then now this is also in the Flying Saucers essay of Jung's. It's a painting by Peter Burkhauser and it's called The Fourth Dimension. And I found this intriguing because if you look at it, there's a sort of, in the middle, there's a source of light thing with, you know, with light, with light coming down. And it reminded me that one of the scientific researchers of crop circles that were looking at 
how are the crops different in a circle compared with out of them? There was a lot of scientific stuff going on in the early days. Um, <laughs> she was a scientist, but she looked at, she had this experience. I think she was in Holland. She was looking out at her, out of her window. Um, I think it must have been at night. And she saw an object, stationary object with lights coming straight down. And she said, <laughs> The next day, a crop circle was actually created in the place where that came down. So that's just an anecdote there. But if you look at the picture, all of it, you'll see sort of forms coming out from another dimension, as it were. And here, I'm adding this one in at this point too, because it's one you're all familiar with, I'm sure. Van Gogh's Starry Nights. Um, but, but I read that this painting came from a dream of his that he described as an ap apocalyptic fantasy in which he compares starry discs, which we don't normally see, see actually as bright as in the painting, um, to a group of living figures who are like one of us. So it sounds to me as if he had some experience of beings from another world that inspired this painting. I thought that was fascinating. Okay, so moving along, here's Jung. Um, so Jung, as, as you know, uh, had many experiences throughout his life um, of synchronicity with patients and colleagues and friends, etc many discussions and he, it, he finally published a um, paper about it uh, which marked a new creative development really in Jung's, th in Jung's thinking and it's it's one that he worked on a lot with Pauli or Pauli I guess Wolfgang Pauli um, who was a quantum physicist and Nobel laureate and they worked together they met uh, because um, Pauli uh, was having personal problems and he worked with well actually an analyst before Jung but he worked with Jung on his dreams and he realized that his he had these amazing archetypal dreams and he realized that um, his dreams were commenting and correcting his science so um, they became th their dialogue was extraordinary how they worked on this psyche matter um situation um and this is what synchronicity draws us draws us atten our attention to and because and i'm going to go into some details here and i hope it won't be boring for you but i really want to draw out the what i feel is important to really contemplate and know about the actual phenomenon of synchronicity so it was very upsetting to write about this because synchronicity doesn't fit the causal laws of science. And that, that's why he calls them an a-causal connecting um, principle. It's where a dream and an event in the world or an event in the world and a dream connect at a certain point. Now, each of those things, the dream, da 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 the thing in the world, da 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 is going. But the moment where they join, that is the a causal moment. You can't say one caused the other or the other caused the one. You just can't say that. Um, so uh, they erupt, as it were, completely spontaneously and unpredictably. You can't make them happen. Um, and in a sense, it was synchronistic that Pauli and Jung met when he was bringing depth psychology in in the 20th century and Pauli was bringing in the new physics, but <laughs> they were working together. So we have the scientist and the depth psychologist both living as it happens in Zurich. So they were able to meet. So synchronicity honors all the things that are not part of our paradigm, meaning the conventional, the one that's going out the door, hopefully, 
it's hanging on, but it's on the way out. Um, so with synchronistic events, they are unique, they are rare, they're not repeatable, and it leads to this aha moment, which is that double wheels where time and eternity sort of whoop, blip into our, and that's when we go, we notice it, <laughs> it has an effect on us and they're meaningful and they normally happen at a particular point that's called the kairos, the right moment. And that's really important to pay attention to as well um, because we need to contemplate, what is this saying about my life? And Jung said, you have to dream them forward, like the dream. He said, you dream the dream forward. He said the same about synchronicities. When you have them, you need to do something with them creatively, not just go, oh, that was a great experience and basically go on with your day. So, um, and there's often a sense of, if not numinosity, the sacred breaking through, something like that. Um, and... Jung called this breakthrough in his language, the one world, Unus Mundus, the one world. And Pauli, from his scientific point of view, called it the psychophysical world. So what they came to understand was that both psychic matter are two sides of the same reality. And we hear a lot about oneness at the moment. It's this, not only the desire for unity, but unity is expressing itself in these ways, if I can put it that way. Now, these kinds of experiences, um, I feel they dip into something that I call eros consciousness or eros awareness, because it, they balance thinking, they, they balance symbolic thinking with a more diffuse state of consciousness, if you really enter into them, that evokes often a very deep feeling response. Um, and they're really fateful. And the reason they're fateful is because it's something that's happened that is beyond your own will. Um, and that's really important. So it's an irrational, it's like an impossible thing that suddenly comes in um, and uh, invites our participation, invites our journeying with it, if you like, um, to create something new. This is really important. And the other thing that happens with a synchronicity is that often you have a feeling of, you, you know something and it's coming not from anything you've learned or anything any, or that you've read or anything that's um, you've been taught, but you find yourself having these, I call it knowledge from the source. You can actually get that sometimes, that feeling when you go into deep meditation as well. So you, things that you don't know, you know, arise to the surface. So here we have words like unique, numinous, subtle, eros, fate, Impossible, co-creation, source knowledge. Aren't these the words that come with the kind of experiences people are having these days? Seems to me they are. Pauli uh, felt that these, this confluence between psyche and matter was a new form of mysticism. And he felt that um, that the exploration that he and Jung were doing uh, would lead to not only a further evolution of consciousness, but also of matter. And he felt this was really important and offered a counter position, position to what he calls the black mass. And that's the idea that acts of will rather than eros or wisdom or love in science, for example, the explosion of the atom bomb could lead to matter taking revenge and beginning to oppose humanity. Now, chatbots, 
My husband's been re reading a lot about chatbots and it's been all over the news and how scary they are. I haven't, I can't bear to look at it because I don't like even the idea of them. But what about climate crises? You see, is this the revenge of matter that we're so identified with in our materialistic society? See, it's, we've lost our connection to the sacred and now matter is taking its revenge. Look at all the uh, climate issues um, and so on. So, um, you know, he had startling synchronicities, the war visions, for example, of the, at the outbreak of World War I, um, his own near-death experience in relation to a heart attack. And uh, this led him into calling the, the archetype, the new transcendent fact, factor, he called it psychoid. That's a word I'm not particularly like, that I don't particularly like, but in, it includes this idea of spirit or psyche um, extending into matter. And the other thing with this is that we can no longer think of psyche as being within it's not only within, you know. It's as if we're in it, <laughs> like a field or an atmosphere, like a drop of water in the ocean. And so it's a moments where we experience the interconnectedness of all of life. Now, here is a picture. Well, actually, that's a picture from my kitchen window. It was meant to be the <laughs> the one I was <laughs> I, is meant to be the one I was showing for synchronicity because I can't take a picture of one. But I had just been back from come back from Israel, and I, uh, Israel, Egypt, and I this was last December, and I looked out the window, and I, I just had this mystical feeling about the way the fog and the everything was hanging together. It just struck me, the oneness of everything. Okay. So now, um, very quickly, some ideas on the background, some historical ideas, because I think they're interesting. And um, so the background to synchronicity and the subtle body, and there's a, there's a quote from Pauli that I got from a friend of mine's book, um, Remo Roth's book, The Return of the World Soul. Um, and he said, what is still older is always the newer. So it's this idea that old things come back again in different forms, in new forms. So they're not really new. Um, there is a historical background, but they're called something else. And so here we see an alchemist with his goggles on, trying to follow Sophia, trying to find out the secrets of nature and other things. So this is um, a beautiful picture. And it says, let nature be thy guide. Let nature be thy guide. So um, before the rise of science as we know it today, the mystic alchemists, especially the hermetic ones who were physicians rather than priests, also recognized an intermediate world where spirit and matter met and where spirit and matter were considered to be of equal value. Um, Jung notes in his alchemy writings when he's not saying that alchemy is a projection of psyche onto matter, that this was a world of subtle bodies. So this subtle non-local world was a sort of potential world and was personified in the Middle Ages with the wisdom of God, the sapientiae dei, the wisdom of God. Or sometimes she was called Mary, and she was considered the creative arm of God, also called the anima mundi, the soul of the world. 
and was an expression of God manifesting himself in the world through a spirit of love. So the anima mundi, if this is back in Middle Ages, was considered an act by the alchemists, not by the church, by the alchemists, the ones, the mystics underneath, there are always mystics underneath every orthodox religion. Um, the anima mundi was considered an active, feminine, energetic principle, a place where magic, or what we would now call the paranormal or psych parapsychological events, took place. Magic was a place where spontaneous new creations out of the world's soul happened based on the timing, divine timing, based on a causality where things change unpredictably. Creations co-created by our observations. So that's synchronicity again. So it was uh, personified as, as Sophia, wisdom, and it was linked with Eros rather than Logos, and it was found in the heart rather than in the head. And Sophia was also connected to something called Lumen Naturae, which I really like, which means the light of nature, or perhaps we would say the spirit of matter. See, this is what we need to connect to, the spirit of matter, the soul of nature, not just noticing trees and objects, but feeling into the aliveness, the consciousness, to make a relationship with matter in a loving way, noticing the spirit of matter. I love that. So, um, and this idea about the light of nature was it emanated from the stars and was associated with the astral body an invisible, subtle body that was born with individuals and that survived physical death. Um, Paracelsus, for example, felt that, um, you know, animals were attuned to the light of nature and the auguries of birds, for example. Well, I mean, how do birds migrate up and down? <laughs> you know, what is the consciousness? I mean, there's so much mystery. There's so much we don't know. Um, and it is this idea that there's wisdom hidden in the natural world and a knowledge beyond concepts of traditional thought, a knowledge that is accessible in an instinctual, intuitive, imaginal way, way based on the authenticity of one's own experience. So um, he thought it was connected to dreams and visions. Um, and it's a light, it's not, it's a, it's a luminosity that's not divorced from darkness. I think that's the important thing. Um, it's, it's dark light, it's stellar light. It's the light that shines in the darkness, if I can put it that way. Um, and also, uh, Paracelsus, for example, who was an alchemist, um, mystic, wrote um, that this light was connected with the star in us. So this light was connected in the star in us that desires to drive humans to great wisdom. So um, another interesting um, Renaissance um, person is a guy, a guy called Ficino, who was a scholar and humanist philosopher. Um, and he regarded the whole universe from states of mind, from stars to states of mind, as a living being, a one world united by correspondences. So the cosmos was a body linked with the world soul and the divine noose, which is universal mind or cosmic intelligence. And through magic, one could influence the divine and corresponding earthly substances. So here's now a chemical picture of the soul of the world, of Sophia or Mary. And the other features of his worldview historically anticipate Jung's notion of synchronicity because it was thought 
you know, that all of nature and the cosmos are alive and animated by soul. And a second feature is the world of the creative or spiritual imagination as the medium through which we can access this intermediate subtle world. And that through engagement with the imagination, the practitioner experiences transformations and transmutations. And by the virtue of the attainment of revealed or direct knowledge, also called gnosis, the human being experiences an inner second birth. And he adds, this often manifests as a spiritual experience that resituates the individual soul in the context of nature and the cosmos and extends into cosmological speculations. So these old ideas are now the ones very much coming in in a very powerful way in physics, in psychology, in um, all kinds of new thinking. Um, you know, Nassim Harriman at the Res Resonance Academy is exploring all the connections between from the Planck level to the universal level, and they all mirror each other and they're all connected. So it's, it's sort of another version of correspondences between everything. It's quite elegant, really, and it's quite beautiful. Um, so again, new, we're having new versions of old ideas. So it, at one point we were connected, but with the rise of science and matter and the materialistic paradigm taking over in the last four or 500 years, we've lost that connection of everything being connected. And that's why it's such a mess, because again, we've lost connection to the thread, the underlying unity principle, the world soul, whatever you want to call it, quantum reality, the zero point field, uh, the quantum vacuum that's really a, you know, plenum, a, fu a fullness, not an emptiness. All these ideas are returning because we need them, because we cannot go on. We're destroying ourselves. We can't go on not reconnecting to nature, not reconnecting to the stars. Now, here is a picture from Jung's Red Book of his guide, <clears throat> his guide that he called Guru and other things. And this is Philemon. And so here's a great example um, of a modern um, mystic who, through his own descent, his own shamanic journey, his own creative illness into the depths, talked to guides, you know, confronted unbelievably painful difficulties and so on. So meditative dialogue, visionary journeying, transformation, and rebirth. And these paintings are very shamanic. They're very beautiful. See how big he is. He's got his feet on some mosque-like building. So he's, he's, he's this sort of huge, I suppose, angelic presence. He's got his snake in the background. <coughs> Often appearing in dreams when you need to take on your own spiritual authority, the snake. But the snake also the symbol of death and rebirth and a host of other things. It's one of the oldest symbols. It's also about healing and wisdom. And one's own darkness too. So here's another picture. Now here's the dragon of our dream, if you like, the dragon paths, the powerful energy of the earth guarding the treasure in the middle, perhaps. And here's a picture of the world tree. So again, it's like a Renaissance picture, but it's a shamanic painting of a modern person, contemporary person. <clears throat> Beautiful. And again, we see the unity of the mysteries above, the heavenly realms, 
the bio field that we live in, the earth and under the earth. It's quite lovely. So um, now I'm going to move on to considering this is another painting from Jung's Red Book, and I'm using it uh, just to talk a bit about UFOs because um, I had a contact experience myself. And one of the things about it was that it was nighttime, but the uh, landscape was illumined, much brighter than a moon. And when I saw that picture, I thought, oh, that's the best one I can find of um, this particular part of my talk. So um, the idea being basically that um, synchronicities are also to be found not just in individual experiences, um, but also in collective or cultural ones. And I think they're very important for the reasons that we're talking about. Um, Jung was very interested in these phenomena and he felt, so he, he did enormous amount of research, but he only published two, two years before his death. Um, he felt that um, uh, that it was important <laughs> Uh, to to really try to understand what was going on here. And he felt that they such anomalous kinds of experiences appear at the end of one worldview or world and in the interim between both. So we've got Pisces that we're leaving associated with the fish and so on, and um, Aquarius to which we're moving now. Um, and so he talked about them in various ways, but mainly he was interested in what do they mean? So again, it's this Jung is always looking forward, not only looking back, but what does it mean that these things are appearing? Here is um, a painting by a patient of Tony Wolf, um, who uh, was one of, was Jung's mistress, I suppose. Um, and she helped him through his descent into the unconscious that eventuated in the Red Book. Um, and I, I find this very, very interesting um, because she not only dreamed of UFOs, but also of waving wheat beneath the water that Wolf and Jung felt anticipated the future and a new vision of reality, which they didn't understand. So here again, we have that interest in what is going on here. Is this an initiation? Is this um, an unveiling, the theme of the apocalypse, an unveiling? Um, is it to do with the new age moving from, you know, these were questions that they entertained. Um, and so Jung thought of them as sort of mandala images because often they're mostly round. Um, and actually at the end of his essay, there's a beautiful story of a man, an American man called Orfeo Angelucci. And he puts that in, that story at the end. And it's a beautiful story because it really summarizes most of the um, experiences that... Um, that experiences ha experiencers have again a powerful exposure to a non-local realm. They meet ETs or guides of the soul. They're often exposed to visions of our suffering earth. Um, they're described as really happening and not a dream. They're both intensely physical as well as psychical. And beyond a sense of meaning, the participant describes illuminative experiences concerning the nature of the world and reality itself, often telepathically communicated by guides or a wisdom figure. Um, then they often gain insight into um, issues of planetary, global, and often galactic significance. So they've been compared to Kundalini awakenings, um, the death experiences have very similar experiences, shamanic journeying, and so on. 
Um, and so with these kinds of experiences, as I say, people move out of just a, a planetary or nature interest that happens with individual synchronicities. They are exposed to not just me and my life. What about the planet? What about the galaxies? What is our place? Are we linked? It, you know, sometimes they learn that what we do here is important because we are linked to other planetary systems, which of course the Egyptians knew in space because they were a star culture. Um, so he tries to understand the metamorphosis, that word I think is really beautiful. What's happening in our world? We need to try to understand it. If there are these archetypal energies that are dismantling and re-emerging, we are all under them. We're all being affected by them. Um, so the, the question is how, how as a planet, how as a value system, how am I, <laughs> you know, um, to try to understand um, even if we don't. That was the important thing, try to understand, even if we don't. Now, crop circles are very similar in a way. He didn't go, go into them because they didn't start appearing until about the 70s or 80s. Um, but if UFOs are a myth of things seen in the skies, which he, was his subtitle to his paper, we can now add that crop circles perhaps are a new myth of things seen on the earth. Again, this alchemical connection between spirit phenomena that has matter and matter, earth, crops that are imbued with spirit because of the very complex geometric designs that are in a lot of them. So again, there is this urge for the unity principle to, to be realized again. Here is um, one of my favorites. Um, I call it the swirling galaxy. It came down in uh, August of 2001. But just a quick note, if there's anyone listening who doesn't know about crop circles, um, there are these patterns that for the last 40 years or so appear in the spring and summer in England and other parts of the world um, that uh, come down completely spontaneously overnight. Again, you cannot predict them. They just come down. And um, they're often, if you go to a very good site that's got a huge library of photographs going back to the 80s or 90s, I can't remember when they begin. Um, it's a site called Temporary, Temporary Temples dot co dot uk you can see how massive they are if you look at the picture uh, if you look at the center do you see the people now that came down during one night which was pelting with rain so it's in a, an awkward place and it's undulating land but actually when you look at the picture it looks quite in perspective <laughs> strange isn't it look at the complexity of it though now, of course, they're dismissed as hoaxes. But you see, that is the voice of the rational mind. It's also the collective newspaper mind, because that's where you normally see, oh, these are just man-made. Um, you know, no one comes forward and says, well, this is how I did it, and that hasn't happened yet. And the two people, uh, I think they were called Doug and Dave, that were set up, they're both dead now, but they were given 10 pounds to say they did it with a with a plank, you know, board and and string. I mean, it's just, it's totally and utterly absurd. But the thing is, there isn't a great deal of curiosity about it. And that I simply do not understand. They're so beautiful. Um, and um, they, they've undergone massive amounts of research by all kinds of people scientists and psychologists and sacred geometers. I've learned a lot from sacred geometers because they can analyze the sacred geometry in many of them. 
and that I just find extraordinary. Um, I've been interested in them since the early 2000s, and I've been in several of them over the years, from 2008, I think was the first time. Um, and their beauty is always something that incredibly affects me. Um, and it reminds me of Plato saying that beauty awakens the soul to what it once knew, but forgot. So this is soul beauty. This isn't prettiness. This is what, awake, what awakens the soul to remember, you know, the treasures of soul life, basically. The treasure of the mysteries. Um, what we've lost in, in, pop, in our collective consciousness, but which is returning. Here's another one, an eight-pointed star. I've also looked at them from the point of view of myth of, as well. Um, so Aphrodite on the theme of beauty, uh, the Demeter and Persephone, corn mother and maiden myth, um, and Osiris, the mystery of wheat. It's this idea that wheat can be cut down, but then it grows again. So life in the, of the soul can be cut down every 10 years or so we go through like a death rebirth process and but you know the little green shoots suddenly gradually start to come up um yeah and the, and the demeter persephone mystery, mysteries were quite complex but the aim in the end was to have an experience that would be a transpersonal type of experience that would lessen the fear of death and where you would feel a sense of immortality, that I am immortal too. So um, are these crop formations trying to wake us up to something? Are we interested? Are we even listening? Um, So for me, these formations are the code, the glyph, the portal through which the golden energy chain of the ancient philosophers, alchemists, and mystics, and our soul ancestors in the stars are pouring this new vibratory star seeding gold as a pure gift to assist us in Earth's move to a higher vibratory reality of both consciousness and matter. You could say the earth is dreaming for all to see. And in its dreams, like all our dreams, our attention is drawn to what we're not adequately paying attention to in ordinary reality. That, to me alone, makes worth contemplating. You know, it's worth contemplating them. You know, we get these free gifts. <laughs> we get these free gifts. Extraordinary. So also myself, I've, you know, because there are so many complex geometries in these formations, more recently, I see them as light codes from the stars and that they can be oracular portals. So what, I, what I've encouraged, what I've done myself and what I've encouraged others to do is to look at the library of pictures from anywhere, any year. And if there's one that really speaks to you, you can use it as a mantic tool. You can use it like a tarot deck or, you know, um, like an I Ching reading or something like that. And if you sit with it and dialogue with it, as you might in a meditation, you can get messages from, your, you know, the source point in yourself, really. Because they are around, they are our Mandela-like structures. And, you know, the circle, after all, is one of the most ancient symbols of the divine. But here we have the divine in matter. You know, geometries are spirit in a way because they're the um they're the they're, they're the grid of reality 
everything we're constructed, flowers, trees, ourselves, are all based on these underlying sacred geometric principles. So in a way, you could say it's like experiencing Sophia too, like in the medieval personification of the soul, the spirit of nature was feminine, it was creative. The feminine principle, matter, because earth matter is always connected with the mother, with the feminine, because she provides <laughs> everything we need. And also, it's not unusual for people to have paranormal experiences when they're in a crop circle, and that can be heightened emotions or not feeling well. Sometimes healings are reported. Um, I had an interesting experience myself back in uh, 2012. I went into a formation I couldn't find it from where I parked my car on the edge and I met a group of people on, on the way toward the formation. And when I, so we were sort of chatting in a casual way, but then when I got to the formation, I, I said, okay, I'm gonna go in and go my own way now. Um, the minute I stepped over into the formation, I had, I was just, utterly filled with unconditional love. It was deeply moving. I felt my heart, my whole body was just filled with unconditional love. That only happened once. But telepathically, the, 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 um, the message was that it was made by Syrians. It was like Syrians, we, we Syrians made this wasn't said like that it was just it all happened in one in one go very beautiful so that stopped me in my tracks really I thought oh there's really something here that needs to be paid attention to and the Hopis you know the Hopis felt that the circles are related not only to cosmic influences and earth changes related to their calendars but also to the to the return of the star nation people themselves so indigenous cultures have high regard for these circles. Um, Credo Mutva in um, South Africa, as a South African Zulu shaman, um, he's passed now, but he said they've been appearing in their fields for thousands of years. And so they don't actually go in them because they consider them sacred land, but they do do rituals and they honor the star people and the earth energies when they do their rituals, but they won't go in them. It's like, I suppose, going into a holy place and just kind of mindlessly, chat, you know, going into the sanctuary and not really thinking about it or something like that. Um, it's interesting, though. Many, many people have come to visit them from all over Europe and America and everything. Um, and um, as previously suggested, um, Sophia being the spirit of matter or middle ground, according to Rudolf Steiner's cosmography, Sophia, wisdom, is approaching our world in her etheric body, in the, in the etheric body of the cosmos as the second coming of the Messiah presents itself, not as a person, but as a presence. I think that's really, really important. He said it was the feminine aspect of the Christ. But in other words, it's a feminine presence. And it, it reminds me that I think as we go through this incredibly initiatory period of descent and rebirth culturally on our earth, presence is something in a way that we need to cultivate because you, it's like you... There are times when you just have to find the place of being really still in the midst of all the mess because there's so much suffering going on in the world at the moment. You see all around us. So we live at a time of both collapse and renewal. 
it's exciting time to be alive, but we're in this kind of liminal space between worldviews. But the energy of the new for me seems to be increasing and taking hold. I've had a lot of people that I know saying this too, that in spite of corruption being exposed and wars being waged and the fact that our environmental crises need much more attention um, as well as the personal challenges that so many people are going through at this time there are at the same time new healing protocols the rise of the sacred feminine and the co-creative power of consciousness and the imagination, the insights of quantum physics demonstrating our interrelated cosmos from the Planck to the galactic levels, technologies that are coming out of unified physics that will help solve the world's problems, and our increasing awareness that we're not alone, our increasing awareness of our galactic neighbors and our source in the stars. As Jung said, we come from the stars and we'll go back there. And all of this is becoming more available and activated in ourselves as we are at the sort of <laughs> switch point. This will go on for hundreds of thousands of years. But right now, we are here at the beginning to witness, embody, give our gift to the world as much as we possibly can. It can be as simple or as complex. It doesn't matter as long as it's yours and it's coming from the heart. So we are becoming more expansive. We are in our consciousness, more multidimensional, able to tap into different frequencies and octaves of experience, grounded with our feet on the earth, connection with the earth energies, the spirit of the earth, and our crowns open to the sky, and the spiritual realms, and the star civilization beings who are helping us with our inner awakening to quantum levels of experience. And perhaps most fundamental of all, non-ordinary experiences are with their deeply transformative capacity are leading us from insight to greater illumination and showing us how the anomalous and the paranormal must once again, as Jung said about synchronicity, be included in our vision of reality. So these signatures, these signs of a companion that one is to follow, signatures lead us from complex emotions to genuine sorrow and authentic joy and they are helping us open our hearts in ever widening circles to self and beyond to community to the earth and to the stars and we're restored to if you like a cosmological myth one in which we, we can become the spokespersons for the invisible and the invisible ones. For me, time and again, love is so often at the heart of these experiences, an immeasurable, unconditional, silent force and presence. And the wisdom that comes from such love can help us to remain balanced and more able to love, even while in the middle of all the joy and cruelty around us, including not just around us, but within us, you know, our own shadow, complexes, challenges, illnesses, um, to find those moments of joy too, which nature can help awaken us um, to. And just, being out in nature, noticing nature. One of the major lessons from my pilgrimage walks, which I did not as, um, you know, I did it as a meditation for the earth because of our environmental crises we were just overwhelming me at one point. 
So I thought, okay, this is something I can do that's practical. I can just put one foot in front of the other. And while I go along, I can notice things. I can try to notice, you know, sounds and trees and tiny flowers and atmospheres and forests and just pour as much love out as I could. Um, and one of the things I basically learned on my walks was that the earth does not want to be fretted over. She wants to be loved. So while we have to read the science and know the science, which often seems so, you know, everything's just doom and desolation. Um, but my reality in walking was that she also wants to be noticed like any relationship, she wants to be noticed, she wants to be acknowledged, she wants to be loved. And in fact, a pilgrimage walk is considered a Compostela, Compostela, Camino Compostela in Spain, in France and other places. Compostela means a walk under the stars, a soul walk. So it's a soul walk that you undertake. You know, you go with all these problems and about halfway through, because you're so exhausted from walking great long lengths every day, all that just fades away. It all, you forget, you forget what all, all your problems are and you just, you just have this experience of the spirit of nature, the Anuramundi. It's a felt experience, that subtle world between up there and down here. It's brimming all around. We're, we're in that ocean all the time. Um, so, you know, in a work that is essential and um, time spent in nature and with the spirits of nature um, as practices um, really help to stabilize the energy of change and the wider arc of consciousness in our bodies, in our physical bodies. So I think all these experiences can also connect us to the infinite and to find meaning in our lives and how our own path relates to the meaning of the unfolding cosmos and our place within it, or at least to search for this, especially at such a challenging time as we find ourselves in today. So I'll just finish with this brief excerpt from a poem of David White's which I often use, I like a lot. What to remember when waking, waking, you probably know it. Perhaps we could say not only what to remember when waking, but what to remember when awakening to the new myth that we are, um, that we are coming to uh, experience today in all its signatures. So the bit that I want to read is just this bit. To be human is to become visible while carrying what is hidden as a gift to others. To remember the other world in this world is to live with your true inheritance. Okay. I'm afraid I lost track of time and I have no idea if this is a good stopping point. It feels like it is. Uh, it could be, it could be. Um, so, uh, you want to open up for questions then? Absolutely. Questions, comments, okay. feelings, anything, sharing. Okay. Maybe, uh, maybe stop your share so we can see you better. Oh, yeah. Somebody okay. just wants to be admitted. So I'm just going to click that. Uh, I, I just admitted them. Oh, you did. <laughs> it was on yeah. my screen. Hang on a minute. Okay. <clears throat> and I'll just remind everyone, if you want to ask a question um, vocally, then have you, make sure your video is on. If you want to ask a question or make a comment, of course, um, and you don't want your video on, then please type it in the chat. I see we have one thing in the chat right now. Um, the reason for that is that this is being recorded. And if your video is not on, then we get a big black screen. So two things in the chat. One is from Catherine Cripps. Thank you. It was encouraging. 
And one is from Mary Rainbow. Thanks, Veronica. This is truly amazing. The Temporary Temples website is a hidden gem. So, uh, and I see a few hands up. So Karen Adler, would you go ahead? Oh, yes, it's just a very quick, I just want to ask, what was the name? I missed the name of the poet. I'm so sorry. I know this is not a very intellectual question. Sorry, Veronica. Um, the name of the poet, oh, David. I David. It, there's, there's no rules on <laughs> anything you say. Um, David White. That's W H Y T. Yeah. W H. Sorry, W H Y. Y T E. T E. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's all. Thank you very much. A wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, really Jane. inspiring. Jane, you have a question. Your hand is up. Um, yeah. Veronica and Taria. Hi, Jane. Hi. The, the trip I took with you in 2019 was so life-changing. And oh. my gratitude, excuse me for crying, but <laughs> there was oh. um, a, a crop circle oh. that I went into the first day that I arrived in England before I met you and, and before I joined your group. That that was completely like that. The minute I I was in there, the unconditional love, and and the healing of uh, like all trauma was removed. I knew it happened, but I was no longer in its grip, yeah. and and I had memories afterwards of like being an infant with my gr maternal grandparents who were all musicians except for my mother. And nodding at my grandfather, and he'd play the fiddle, and my grandmother, and she'd play the mandolin, and this one, uh, and so on, a different instrument. But it was it was an experience of true innocence before I got damaged. And I also uh, it also took away my jet lag, as if to show me this really happened. So, um, and, and that so was glad. the beginning, and it went on and on. Um, and I, my gratitude to you, Antaria, is just immense. I left a writing group and a and a poetry group after, not at some point because it wasn't touching anything that was in, in this new world. And mm. I went back, but on a different footing. Mm. And um, mm. I've written you letters mm. I haven't sent, so I'm blathering now. <laughs> <laughs> But, it's but, lovely to see you, and thanks for sharing that, Jane. That's that's really wonderful. Yeah, really, magic happens. It mm -hmm. does, and it's and it's so long lasting, and it affirms every every other thing. Great. Every yeah. other preceding one, and mm. following one that follows. Well, we certainly had adventures on that. <laughs> on that journey. The, the journey that Jane is referring to is um, a pilgrimage that I led in that was connected to the sacred landscape of England. Um, and the myths that we were looking at were essentially the Grail myth uh, and the early Christian Gnostic myth, because um, Joseph of Arimathea, uh, Jesus's uncle, uh, came to uh, Glastonbury with Jesus and you know huge entourage to undergo the initiations into the Druid um, mythic system and Joseph of Arimathea who was this sort of rich merchant um, built the first Christian church on English soil and um, yeah it, it, it's reflected in the the Blake him that some of you probably know, Jerusalem, and did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's mountains green and did the holy lamb divine or something. Um, uh, and so Blake, who was a visionary as well as an artist, uh, also uh, subscribed to this view that Jesus indeed walked in the green and pleasant lands of England. And my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, um, also believed this idea and, he, and people in my family just thought he was nuts 
um, you know, that's absurd. He didn't, you know, he lived in Palestine. He didn't come to England sort of thing. Well, now we know he went to India and all kinds of places um, to uh, undergo initiations in different spiritual traditions. This is Jesus and Mary Magdalene I'm talking about now and a host of others, um, uh, including going to Egypt and the initiations in Egypt. But they also came to England. And um, so that's a, a huge imprint into English sacred soil for me. And Joseph of Arimathea also took two cruets of wine from the crucifixion and buried them at Chalice Well. At least my research said that. I mean, yes. how, how he got there, who knows, but, <laughs> but also that he went to, he, oh no, he was imprisoned for that. And, and Jesus went to him and explained a lot of the mysteries while he was in prison. Oh, that's right. That's, yeah, these are the legends. There's, so there's sort of historical documentation. But with all of these things, there is legends as well. It's the same with Mary Magdalene. There's a lot of history that is almost proves that she went, lived and taught in, in Provence after the, and actually came down through the Languedoc, which is where my husband and I live. Um, down in the southwest, which is the so-called Cathar country, because they were a Gnostic Christian group here in this area um, between the 11th and 13th centuries, um, and they they were horrified at the corruption of Rome, and they wouldn't have anything to do with Rome, and so they just used Mary Magdalene's gospel, that's now just been uh, well ten years ago. Um, release the uh, Gospel of the Beloved Companion, which if you're interested in, in Mary Magdalene, um, is an astounding document. Um, there were fragments of her gospel that were found before, but this, this one was intact because the tradition that holds this document in its original knows that it came from the first century and um, they've had it in their tradition ever since. And uh, there are new members of that tradition that are that have come to live here again now, actually. Um, so, uh, but anyway, they were they were there was a terrible genocide. They were all got rid of by the church and by the assenting beings in France, the king or whatever, because they 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 just went along with the pope because actually the the French just wanted the land because it's so beautiful down here flourishing um, sort of uh, countryside, farm, farming, vineyards, that sort of thing. Very beautiful. Anyway, I'm going off. Any more questions or comments um, or feelings or anything? There's a comment in the chat from uh, Marion Freiberg saying, so beautiful, Veronica, your talk opened me to and reminded me of threads across my life about Western esoteric wisdom. Thank you for all you are revealing to us at this vital point. And Thank there's, you. and there's a, uh, Alain, you have your hand up. Thank you. And thank you, Veronica, for a most inspiring and beautiful presentation. I love the pictures. And uh, I did follow Mary Magdalene in various places in France at one time when I was still in France that uh, where she was at and was very inspired. You you mentioned the Hopi and I'm studying now what can be learned from the indigenous wisdom, not just in the US, but all around the world. And uh, have you have you connected? I know you've uh, connected with the Egyptian tra uh, tradition and many others. Do you find something in the indigenous tradition that uh, corroborates what you are seeing uh, from the other sources you have looked at? Especially oh, the uh, relationship with that's, nature that's... and... Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, that's all right. Thank you. Um, my first exposure to an indigenous person was in my mid thirties. I'm in my early seventies now, was in uh, the mid uh, my mid thirties. So it was the mid eighties. Mm -hmm. And um, I had an extraordinary experience with her. She was part of the 
Seneca Indian tribe of New York State. Yeah. Uh, I was living in Connecticut at the time, but she would do readings for people um, in New York City. So I liked the sound of her. My best friend at the time told me uh, about her. And um, so I went for a reading. And uh, so I got there and she said, why are you here? And I thought, oh, I thought it was obvious because I came for a reading. <laughs> so I said, um, I've come for my reading. <laughs> and she said, are you sure? And I said, yes. Mm -hmm. And then I suddenly got this feeling that she was reading me. And she said, are you sure there's not something else going on? And um, in fact, I was pregnant with my second child in the fourth month. So I wasn't really showing. And anyway, it was February. So it was New York February. are so horrible, as you know, they're very, very cold. So everyone was bundled up sort of thing. So you couldn't see um, from that physically. So, um, so uh, and the thing that was actually bothering me was that because I was 35 at the time, and according to all the doctors, completely over the hill that I was having a second child, <laughs> which is absurd now, obviously. I mean, it's just so totally ridiculous. People <laughs> are having babies in their 40s and 50s. Anyway. Then 35, you were over the hill. So they wanted me to have an amniocentesis, which I did not like the, the sound of because it was a needle going into my tummy and I didn't want my baby's world to be, um, to be you know, invaded like that. I just, my whole body recoiled from it. But you know, there's, here's the medical profession saying, well, you need to know because you're so old. <laughs> um, anyway, so, uh, so I told her that story. So I, I, I told her that. And she said, you know what she said next? She said, so do you want to go in and ask your baby if they're all right? And that was my first shamanic journey. Mm -hmm. It was very powerful. So she was already reading me way before. I mean, she was already seeing. She's the only completely clairvoyant person I think I've ever met. She could tell what you ate yesterday, the dinner type of thing. So uh, we did nothing at all fancy, just light breathing, meditation, and I went right into it like that. There was no, there was no sort of break. I don't even know what happened, but that was the effect of her presence, obviously, as well. And so I saw my son, little boy, running over a hill like mad, coming towards me, running over the hill. So I knew he was incredibly energetic, and I knew he was totally healthy and I knew he really wanted to be here mm. and it was a profoundly moving experience you can imagine perhaps you know then I didn't have to do the amniocentesis um, you know she went on to tell me about my fate what my what I was doing here and um, gosh things that, that have gone into the lands of time now, I've got a tape still of this it, this session was just extraordinary and she she told me the fates of my two children that have been completely accurate. She said that my daughter would be an artist and would like working in community with other artists. She lives outside Barcelona in Spain and works for an artist <laughs> residency program. Um, she said my son would be a custodian of the earth. He's an organic biodynamic farmer in in um, you know Mississippi. So. Uh, and then, so then I did some work with her individually, but, you know, we also did sweat lodge ceremonies, which are extraordinary uh, rituals. And I think, you know, this kind of seeing and this kind of practice is true across the board with all indigenous peoples. Um, and the other thing she told me about was my connection to the stars. Uh -huh. And of course, all indigenous nations have connections to the stars because those are their ancestors. Those are their guides. That's who they, you know, do ceremony for to get the wisdom from the ones beyond time. And this is what happened in ancient Egypt, too, um, when the pharaoh would do the death rebirth mysteries, literally going to the point of death and stepping over to get the wisdom from the star beings and then coming back. Mm. Um, and 
dispensing the wisdom to the community so that the land would flourish. And can you imagine if our completely screwed up leaders in most of our countries had to do a death rebirth ceremony? <laughs> that you couldn't become a president or a or a king or a god knows what unless mm. you'd proven yourself worthy to be of service i mean yeah. what a different world eh? i mean yeah, instead of how much money you can raise yes and keep yeah. raising mm -hmm. <laughs> even when you don't want it anymore we don't need it i can't imagine what they spend it on um so I, I, there were certain things that I learned from her. That's what I'm trying to say, Alain, that, yes. um, you know, about past lives, about shamanic journeying, about a connection to the stars, about uh, various uh, sweat lodge ceremonies, um, uh, rituals connecting with Mother Nature. That's right. Um, and as I say, I think these are across the board. They are... Are there ones that you're particularly drawn to learning from? I think that's a place to start, maybe. Yeah, yes, I'm, I, I, I'm uh, connected mostly here in, I live on the West Coast uh, now in, in Portland. And I, I'm mostly connected yes. through a friend through the Blackfoot heritage and the Lakota okay. heritage. And this, yeah. I find that they are very, and it's so interesting that they're also the convergence between uh, uh, modern science physics as you said uh, quantum physics and the uh, uh and 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 the indigenous uh, understanding in fact uh, uh david bohm you may know that said that the uh, blackfoot particularly because he was in touch with them at the time uh, had a much better understanding of quantum physics than most of his colleagues that were, you know, from the traditional sciences. It's, it's yes. an intuitive understanding of that. So I find the fact that uh, more and more indigenous wisdom is talked about, sought, uh, as a good sign that we are trying to overcome 400 years of uh, uh, Western uh, modern thinking dominant thinking that has covered up all the things we knew before so so yeah. thank you again for what you're offering us uh, well thank you and and thank you for listening and and good luck on your search with you know with the indigenous people in my experience are just extraordinary i mean i've i i met i met also in peru and in egypt and um yeah, yeah. They, they are way ahead in their consciousness. Yes. So it's where we need to go. Exactly. Yeah. And we are we're together with a few friends putting together uh, what we call a regenerative elder process so that elders, modern elders, can actually uh, uh, continue growing as elders while also offering a different type of service to society than they have in previously in their life. And I find some of these sources are particularly helpful to challenge the worldviews that we've been living with, educated with. Absolutely, because the, the old people are the elders, they are the wise ones, they've had the life experience, you know? Yes. People say, when we retired, um, in 2015 from our teaching positions, people said, oh, what's retirement like? As if, you know, I was going to go and play golf or something for the rest of my life. I mean, you know, you go on growing, you go on learning, you, you have, you continue to have change and, and it just takes another form. Yes. And, um, but old people, especially in America, um, you know, when you're old, you're, marginalized it's incredible. you're not wise you just you be, oh. you're almost encouraged to become kind of stupid you know it um, yeah. we should get rid of the word retirement in my book it should be yeah. as you said regeneration regenerative i love that that's a beautiful word mm. yeah thank you thank you um, i have three three um people in the chat uh charlie said thank you veronica for illuminating this beautiful vision of the way before us and giving us stepping stones for the journey. Um, Nina, 
Nina. Oh, yeah, it's Nina, not Charlie, but it says Charlie. Um, and Alex said, thank you for such a beautiful presentation. And Robert said, so beautiful, insightful, and heartfelt. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I have a question about the crop circles. Are they diminishing in number? You know, that's a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, short answer is, yes, they are. And I actually have a theory about that. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, one thing that my Indigenous teacher, the one I was talking about, told me was about the so-called ascension process. So this was the period from the, for those of you who can remember that the so-called harmonic convergence of 1987, July 1987, to 2012. And this was considered by indigenous calendars cross-culturally to be a time when the earth would decide whether it was going to go into an ascension process. An ascension process means whether it would become a galactic planet, part of the galaxy. This was the teaching of indigenous peoples. So it was a preparation period. And she told me that there was that the earth would indeed move on to her higher vibration, but it, there was, it was no means a done deal that, um, that humans would. And she said, you know, in a, in a kind of forthright way that only shamans can say, they said, so if they don't, she'll slough them off. That's mm. what she said. The earth is not going to wait for everybody to, to catch up. We're supposed to be helping this process, moving in to a more loving, wiser, um, care of the earth planet and aware of our other neighbors in the stars and it's just egregious that we've lost this connection, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So um, if you think about the 80s and 90s and into the early 2000s, all the bad stuff, of course, went on, continued to go on. But it was a time of a kind of explosion of what some people call New Age, although I kind of recoil from that word phrase um but <laughs> nevertheless no nevertheless people got interested in um ufos people got interested in alternate forms of healing people started learning about shamanism and so on and so forth so there was a tremendous explosion really of new thinking you know new energy work in healing all kinds of things and um, and then 2012 happened. And of course, it's gone on since then, of course, because in fact, the decision was made, apparently, according to indigenous people, to we were just about 50-50 tipping over into the, okay, they've got enough wisdom. They're not doing great, but they've got enough to, to move on. Um, and so that was the decision that was made. And um, now, I've talked about crop circles as a collective synchronicity. In other words, one that isn't just personal, one that has to do with the earth and the spirit of the earth and the union of the spirit and matter on the earth. And um, Jung said that synchronicities happen when we are unconscious. So if we're unconscious about something is when they also tend to happen because they are a guiding principle. If you're wandering off your path, you can have something that was sort of like a benign shock treatment. A synchronicity can some kind of sort of wake you up and sort of steer you back on. Um, it's that kind of thing. But if you learn the lesson, you don't need it to repeat itself. So my theory is, this is just a theory, if the crop circles have done their job effectively, 
seeding the planet with the new energies of the new era. And enough people over the four, last 40 years have paid attention. Maybe we don't need so many of them. And maybe they will taper off. There, there is evidence in the historical record that um, they've appeared before at different times. Um, but I, I just wonder, I, so I'm intrigued by your question because I just wonder if they don't need to stay. <laughs> right. Sounds a bit sort of like no, that. I because they have continued, yeah. but they are less. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gail, okay. go ahead. Sorry. Um, Margie has her hand up. Hi, Margie. Hi, Margie. I was in uh, email contact with you a couple days ago. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. Margaret, I'm the Margaret who was in contact with you. Um, I want to thank you um, for starting with and for sharing your dream and for really showing, um, you know, how dreams can open us to so many different realities. And the big dreams are really not just for us personally, but um, they're for the collective. Right. And how they can show us what's going on. And uh, my dreams have been guiding lights and some of them through the years. And some of the, many of them are personal, but there's those ones that you never forget that um, really go beyond and are so much bigger. Yeah. And okay. um, I, like I had one when I first arrived in Zurich to study at the Jung Institute and it completely, you know, I still remember it. And it's one mm. of those things that had to do with the whole rise of feminine consciousness in our mm. world and the change. Um, anyway, um, I want to thank you too for sharing some of those uh, paintings from the Red Book because they are so deep. They reminded me of experiences that I had in dreams years ago. And I remember a Jungian telling me that, you know, I was in my 20s and I had the psyche of a woman in her 50s. And I was wondering, what do I do with all this? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and it's been an ongoing discovery and led me down many pathways. But... Um, well, I'd like to acknowledge my friend Taria, who on, on my screen is, is to your left, because she's she has a dream sym symposium that she runs every month. Um, oh. And also she knows a hell of a lot about uh, David Bohm, uh, Alain. So just so you know, I okay. keep trying to persuade her to do a course on it and I haven't succeeded yet. I keep badgering her to do an online course on David. That, Bowen, that would be great. Oh, that, that would be great. Nice. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I interrupted you, but she on my. That's all right. I don't really have a question. There was just some of those things that you included in your talk and your yeah. experience of being in a crop circle, you know, and the, the, the numinous, luminous mm. um, healing yeah. experience that you and so many have had. I have a friend who's very into crop circles and um, with the society. I haven't had the experience yet of going to England and um, being in a crop circle, but I would real. Uh, but I feel very drawn. Yeah. Well, look at the images um, because of the internet. One of the good things about the internet is that on temporarytemples.co.uk.co.uk there's a massive um, uh, photographic library. So you can explore them that way. And as I said, I've used them as um, ar oracular tools and I've done it quite a bit. And I've encouraged other people to do it too, because yeah, you, you, I, I always think with the one that strikes you, the picture that strikes you, the formation that gets you here, you know, that's the one that wants to interact with you. Mm. That's the one that has the information, the light code for you at this particular moment in time. That's how I, anyway, if you use them that way, if you can't go in them, that is another way to relate to them for sure. 
That is a fascinating way that you suggested of, of relating to them. That speaks to me. Great. Well, good luck. And thank you for sharing. And, and thank you for your emails. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yes. Robert? Robert. Uh oh, where did he go? You're you got to unmute, Robert. Hmm? I can't do that. Is that better? Yeah, yeah that's, that's fine. Better. Okay, your your talk was not only the breadth of what you've covered, but the depth and from the heart, and how you talked about the signatures of what is coming, but also at the same time did not leave out. What are the shadows that we're still facing? What's there? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I was, you know, I was thinking of that line from the song by Leonard Cohen. It's through the cracks that the light comes in. Mm -hmm. So we're all fragile or cracked in some way. And when you're carrying all of this, both in its breadth and its depth, how does one, you or anyone of us, deal with all of this without being completely overwhelmed with overwhelmed by everything that you experience oh, everything that you have about the signatures that are breaking through oh. without forgetting what all of the breakdown has been and is still occurring mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. taking all of that with with uh seriousness and heart and uh how is it how does one deal with that without being overwhelmed by all of it <laughs> well i happen to know that you are like a triple double this is my my husband he's he's a scorpio i wasn't going to say that <laughs> go, <laughs> go ahead so, um but um ha, so you know how i do i enjoy life Okay, so I am normal <laughs> ninety five percent of the time, or at least I try to be. Uh, well, I don't try to be normal, but actually, I walk a lot, um, and that's why I do these pilgrimages. Um, my daughter and I are going to do one at the end of um, April across northern Spain, I think, and um, you know what to say I think a lot of my Jungian training has helped me with that to be honest because I learned very early on that you can get overwhelmed with dreams which I did in the beginning that's why um, I went into my first analysis in my 20s because I was being overwhelmed by dreams but I learned you don't shirk your other responsibilities so for example I was in graduate school at the same time and I would say, oh, I just don't think I can get up. I'm, I'm so overwhelmed. And my analyst said, get up, go to class, do your thing. So you have to remain close to sensei, normal, everyday reality. Um, and, you know, you keep talking about them is terribly difficult. And I'm not actually sure I'm very good at it because it's so hard to talk about these what to me are mysteries that are so important for the shift in consciousness that's going on. And so few people seem to be interested in this topic, these topics. And it makes me sad because the, the, they're free gifts that come out of uh, nature and the stars and they want to teach us, they want to help us, the earth wants to help us. And, um, Walking is good. Enjoying good wine in France and dinner every night is good. <laughs> Which yeah. I'll be cooking in a minute. <laughs> Alain knows about, about uh, French wine um, and yeah. how good it is. We, our house looks onto a vineyard. So mm. we're in the realm of Dionysus. I, I think you, you have to create your boundaries Whatever you can between your experiences, your expression of them in work, your family time, your children, you know, 
you doing stuff you like doing, movies, it, be normal, be, be ordinary. I don't mean be normal, be ordinary as well. That's how I keep the balance. I, I just wanted to be very clear. I know that personally, but I wasn't asking the question as Robin, your husband. I was asking the oh, question I'm, as one, as one. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm addressing one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because what, all of one us needs really- to be ordinary. Yeah. I think any one of us who are here have the same question. You know, when 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 you have a a vocation, maybe you don't want to choose it into these kinds of experiences, then it, it is the question you have to face. How does one do that without losing one's grip? And I I know how you do that, but I I just thought it would be good to express it in public. No, I think you're right, though. I think it's a very important question because um, we do need to live in this world, too. You see, it's that's what the poem says, bringing the invisible here. Yeah. But you have to find ways of doing it, you know, Mm. that are life supporting for you and your body. And I was just, the examples I gave were simply a means of saying, be ordinary and enjoy ordinariness too. Yeah. Enjoy communion with friends, you know, all of this. There's, there, everybody has to find their own way, of course, individually. But that's how yeah. I keep the balance. And I think work. gratitude is a very important. Um, gratitude, yes. Gratitude, you know, uh, yeah. to, to yeah. think to find things and cultivate gratitude, find things to be gratitude. grateful for. I think gratitude is a, a very important balancing force. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, so there, cool. some, yeah. Uh, Maya put a comment in the chat. So much to comment on. I'm fascinated with you, with all you mentioned on Mary Magdalene as I have been called to work with her and channel and write about her teachings on embodiment and so excited to hear all you spoke of spirit in matter and vice versa. Also want to mention the mist in your photo, which I feel is in some way a bridge of consciousness. That's so beautiful. What a beautiful <laughs> thing to say, because that's very intuitive. I'm sorry, what, what was the name of the person who left? Amaya uh, Minwa. It's, it's here I am. <laughs> yes. Where, um, oh, there you are. Thank yes. you. Yeah, actually, um, the voice, I can't remember if I said this in the talk, but the voice in my head that came as I, I was totally taken up in the mysticism of that moment. I, I thought I tried to get the photograph to to um, to capture that, and you obviously picked it up because the voice in my head was, "This is the Grail." Mm-hmm. That was the voice in my head when I looked out the wow. window. Well, that gives me the chills. <clears throat> but um, I I was just walking in our woods the other day, and we're very fortunate to have uh, the land that we have in the springs, and um, I kept. I couldn't stop looking at the mist because I heard uh, a, a, a weather report that said, well, because of our climate change, we're, have, we're seeing more mist in the winter. And I thought, well, uh, we're supposed to be seeing it because it's changing us. Uh, to me, when you drive through a fog, or a, and of course, it's the word mystical, and mm-hmm. so that that was so moving to me that that photo because it's very to me it's a consciousness that I connect with literally and um, be, because of the liveliness of our woods we haven't done much to change things and you can feel that consciousness every day mm-hmm. and um, that is. And, and what the, the Magdalene was asking me to bring through was actually a book um, that she called the eight, the eight Points of Awareness. And it was all about, it is all about um, everything you mentioned on the spirit in matter and matter in spirit. And it, it was all her, her, what I was fortunate to bring through um, the channel was 
uh, exactly that uh, connection that um, that is going to bring us to another level of yeah. of honoring matter, and you mm -hmm. can feel it. The practice is quite simple and profound at the same time. And but mm -hmm. I so loved all that you uh, the the photos with the jar and the images. Um, oh, I got so many of them. <laughs> beautiful, and that mm -hmm. you don't really see of her in that way, and that's the her that I see. Um, because I'm also an alchemist with uh, oils. And so I she literally uh, tapped me on my shoulder one day. And mm. um, I feel like that alchemy connection is so important with oils. And it's I'm, I've been working on something to understand what if we uh, don't have those fragrances, can we just work with the spirit? And of course, it's a big yes that that is what we work with. So I've I've learned so much, and I so appreciate your expressions of the subtle and everything that you talked about. It's just gave me chills half the time. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, the the Magdalene presence is very. I don't know how to say it's very special. It's. Um, <laughs> just a quick story um when she actually came to me first after I had a big dream one of those dreams that I it was in 2016 and my life has been completely altered by this one dream that I can remember so clearly and um but working on the dream I did some shamanic journeying because it was a powerful image but I really wanted to get more specific about what the meaning of that particular symbol was in my dream. And um, so I started this, uh, and she was the first one that came in. It, it was of a grail chalice coming out of the sea, the dream. That was a kind of vision, wow. and uh, but I was asleep. But um, so I, when I opened up to, well, what, what, is, what does this mean? I'm not sure I put it exactly like that, but, um, the first figure that came in was, was Mary Magdalene. And mm -hmm. she said to me, follow the blue rose, follow the path of the blue rose. And um, I didn't know what she was talking about. And then she disappeared. That was it. The other day, this was in 2016. The other day, so I, my life completely changed. It was why I do pilgrimages, uh, or why I did up until COVID, um, et cetera. But, um, and I learned so much about her, like you probably have as well. But the other day I was looking for um, some alchemical pictures, the one of the Anima Mundi for this talk. And I have a book on alchemy and mysticism. And I came across, I've never seen this before, a blue rose, an alchemical blue rose from the 16th or 17th century, I can't remember. Wow. And the writing on the side says that the blue rose that doesn't have an autonomous color in alchemy, like the red, the white, and the black, those are all, all symbolic in alchemy. Um, <laughs> uh, but it is the flower of wisdom. And I, that just knocked me over sideways. I thought it was so beautiful. Lo, these many years later to come across that quite spontaneously when I was looking for something else. And I've never seen that. I've never heard any other person mention it. Nothing. But there it was on the page and some other things as well. But, um, you know, I knew that now, I discovered my own version of the Blue Rose Path because I didn't know what it was. And I, I thought, oh, I've got to make it up. And, I, and then I had further dialogues with her and she told me things. And then, you know, that's where my pilgrimages came out of, frankly, out of my dialogues with her. Uh, that's why we moved to France, actually. <laughs> um, but uh, so, but then, uh, you know, seven years later, for this thing from the outside, that it is in fact 
an esoteric symbol of wisdom just yeah. was so beautiful. I felt like such a gift had been bestowed. I mean, it was just awesomely amazing. And I'm yes. deep to gratitude, speaking of gratitude, very, very great. And it just has given me courage to keep going, you know. Well, what, what I did whispered in my ear, I was in Mount Shasta and I was sleeping on the floor. It was a, a tiny cabin my friend offered me uh, that she was living in. And in the middle of the night, I woke up and I heard um, two phrases. Through the mists of Avalon, she moves in and out of my heart, breath of the rose. And I was told, wake up, write it down, and um, make sure you write it down because you won't remember it. And so <laughs> I did in the dark. I'm like lying on the floor. Right. And um, my, my friend, and who was also a spiritual teacher, when I told her in the morning, she said, Maya, she said, just keep repeating that. Mm. And um, and I repeated it. Um, and a year later, a, another ch teacher channel brought through the message from her that she wanted me to do this work. And so I always called her the breath of the rose. And oh, uh, I, I asked, uh, I actually had a dialogue with her and said, are you the breath of the rose? And she said, that's what your heart wants to call me. And um, so uh, it's just profound. Um, yeah. Thank that, you for sharing all of that. That's thank beautiful. you for listening. Really lovely. Yes. There's but quite a lot. You. There's quite yeah. a lot on the internet about, I just Googled blue rose, al alchem alchemical blue rose, and a lot of things came up. You might want did, to. Did, did they? Yeah. I, yeah. I did that early on too, but there was one uh -huh. Gnostic church that was, the church of the blue rose and i looked in and i thought that that's not that's not uh, that doesn't speak to me at all i couldn't uh -huh. and yeah. then there was one other thing that i that came up and again it just was so far from right character and personality it's just yeah. uh -huh. so i made it up in the end but yeah <laughs> good, that's, good that's to know that there are others out there <laughs> right well i'm i'm afraid we're out of time and oh God, i yeah. wish we weren't but uh I want to thank you very much, Veronica, for for taking this time for us. And and uh, it's been so much of what you talk about is so thought provoking, and so much of what you talk about is so familiar on a deep level as well. Um, and thank you all for attending. And yes, uh, I hope we'll see you again sometime soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. Again, it's an honor to be here and it's lovely to meet all of you and thank you for, for being here. Our pleasure.